have the tremendous privilege each year of editing this publication, looking ahead, asking clever people uh, to give their predictions. And this is a sort of extraction of some of the main themes that seem to me to be interesting. So I hope that in the next 20 minutes or so, you get a kind of mosaic picture of some of the things to expect in 2017, and then we can discuss them uh, more with the Prime Minister and with our other uh, speakers this evening. So let's begin. Ten, and you've seen these, uh, many of these anniversaries already in this calendar that you saw, but it struck me that there's a kind of revolutionary theme to many of the big anniversaries happening in 2017, which is perhaps fitting for the times uh, that we're going through uh, politically. So here is Martin Luther, 500 years ago, nailed his 95 theses to a church door in Wittenberg Castle, or so the uh, legend has it, and thereby set off, that was the sort of, in the equivalent of today's parlance, they went viral, and lo and behold, you had a Protestant uh, reformation. Uh, and that will be commemorated in all sorts of events in Germany uh, and beyond. This chap you probably won't have heard of, um, Pires uh, and the, I can't remember, Fernau de Andrao, Fernau Pires de Andrade, I'm pronouncing that wrong, I'm sure, but he was Portuguese gentleman who opened the West's first diplomatic mission to China 500 years ago uh, this year. So if you like, that was the beginning of uh, uh, the, the kind of diplomatic relations we see today. A hundred years ago, more somberly, that America entered the First World War, a reminder that if America turns its back on the world, the world has a nasty habit of drawing America back in. Fifty years ago, since the first human heart transplant, I'm sadly over old enough to remember that dramatic uh, event. This is one that I really like. Sweden, 50 years ago this year, had so-called H-Day. Maybe there are some Swedes among you here. And what it did was it uh, switched from driving uh, on the left to driving on the right. Now, this is not something you want to try to do gradually. You need to do this all at once. So it's a rather dramatic policy change. So uh, I like it because it's an ex example of dramatic change, but also the Swedes had a referendum a few years before this about whether they wanted to switch from one side to the other. And by about 90%, they said, no, they didn't want to switch. But the government went ahead and did the sensible thing anyway. So that's a very good lesson for me anyway. This chap uh, is a remarkable man called Karl Dreis, who invented the machine you saw 200 years ago this year. It was called the Laufmaschine. It was rather like a bicycle. He could have gone down as the man who invented the bicycle, except he forgot to put the pedals on. But he will at least get a commemorative medal this year. Uh, now we get on to the true revolutionaries. Karl Marx, 150 years ago, published the first uh, volume of his Das Kapital. Uh, and here we have uh, Che Guevara, you saw in the... Um, in the calendar there, uh, 50 years ago, he died, and Cuba's going to be particularly fascinating, I think, in 2017. And then the big revolutionary anniversary, Vladimir Lenin, uh, his Russian revolution, uh, his October revolution, which strangely enough happens in, um, in November because of the change of calendar. But that there will be lots of comparisons, I think, of the conditions in Russia in uh, in 1917 and the conditions in the world today in 2017. And then finally, I do find it extraordinary that this man, another bearded revolutionary, Steve Jobs, we've just had this anniversary, launched his, uh, the iPhone just 10 years ago and so much has changed as a result of that. Okay, so that's the revolutionary mood music for the year. Now for number nine, nine elections to watch. Uh, here are two of them. On the right is Gert Wilders from Holland. On the left, Marine Le Pen in France. Gert Wilders... The Dutch election happens in March. That will give a first indication of whether the sort of revolutionary mood or populist mood uh, that we've seen in some recent elections carries through into Europe this year. And then the big one, France, with Marine Le Pen very likely to get through to the second round. Uh, but uh, we now have the, so the, the, the socialist primary going on. Already big upsets have happened. The people who were expected to be the front runners for the... Uh, centre-right, uh, Sarkozy uh, and uh, Juppé were both beaten by François Fillon, so it's wide open in France, and this is really, I think, the most important election that's going to happen in the year ahead. If Marine Le Pen wins, uh, and I think she's taken great uh, uh, encouragement from the surprise victory of Donald Trump, uh, if she wins, it would still be a surprise, because what tends to happen in France's two-round system 
is that the mainstream parties uh, coalesced to oppose the National Front, and that's what happened to her father in 2002 when Jacques Chirac uh, beat him. But she is a much more credible candidate. She's getting, uh, she's very, very effective in her, in her operations and in her appeal to France. And she appeals to a lot of the same sorts of discontent that uh, fueled both, I think, Brexit and, and uh, Donald Trump's victory. If she wins, the consequences for Europe are really dramatic. A real earthquake, she wants a, a similar sort of Frexit referendum as our Brexit referendum. So Europe's future would really be up in the air if she were to win. So brace yourselves for that. But I don't think we're necessarily going to have an Italian election this year. That's Matteo Renzi, who just lost his referendum, uh, and who uh, that means it means that there may be, he had to resign, there may be a a referendum this year, but there's a uh, an election this year, an early election. There's a good reason why Italian MPs might not want an election, which is to do with their pensions, that if they can't stay through to the end of the term, I think their pensions get increased by quite a lot of money. So that's a strong incentive not to have it, but it wouldn't be surprising to have an early election there. And of course, the other big one is Angela Merkel in Germany. I think she will win, but eyes are also on the so-called alternative for Germany. Uh, which is likely to enter the Bundestag for, first, for the first time. And again, Angela Merkel has suffered uh, a lot in the polls following uh, the migrant uh, uh, crisis that, that unleashed, uh, was unleashed a year and a half or two years ago. Outside Europe, we have an election in Kenya, which is always a very excitable affair, uh, be dramatic. In uh, South Korea, we have a full-blown political crisis. The president has, uh, is being impeached. Uh, uh, because of a scandal, and we could well have the election that was scheduled to happen at the end of the year could well happen earlier, and it may well be that uh, one of the contestants in that election is Ban Ki-moon, the former head of the UN, or we might get someone completely fresh-faced after this uh, period of scandal in, in Korea, but obviously a very important country. Uh, Iran has a presidential election. Iran we're going to watch very closely what happens to the nuclear deal with America now that Donald Trump is uh, president. Hong Kong chooses its chief executive rather controversially because China vets all the candidates. Uh, so that could, be, uh, that could be lively. And China itself, of course, it doesn't have a proper election, but it does have a huge political event happening in the autumn of this year. It's party congress, which happens once every five years. The Central Committee meets. And that's Xi Jinping's chance to put his people in many more key positions down the senior hierarchy of the uh, Communist Party in the Central Committee and in the Politburo and the Standing Committee of the Politburo. He's already the most powerful uh, Chinese leader since at, le at least Deng Xiaoping. This is his chance to become even more powerful. This will concentrate the minds in China throughout the year, and it's why the relationship between him and Donald Trump is particularly vital this year, because if Donald Trump plays it tough with China, China will always play it tough back, but this is an extra reason, the prospect of this uh, crucial meeting in the Chinese political calendar for him not to give an inch. So watch that space. Eight points for the Brexit barometer. Well, we devised this sort of a Brexit barometer to, as to whether it swings between towards hard or soft Brexit. And you can see a number of things that will influence it, the economy, uh, the pound and inflation, um, big foreign investors, whether they uh, pull out their money or indeed come in, um, the migration numbers, because migration is a very hot uh, topic in the whole Brexit debate and political wars in both um, Westminster between those who favor hard versus those who favor soft, and in Brussels and in Europe more broadly, all the elections we've been talking about. The biggest thing is, I think, public opinion, this uh, final factor. What is, what m does public opinion move? Is it comfortable with a harder rather than a softer Brexit? And of course, we just had last week Theresa May spelling out her ideas on, uh, on Brexit, which to my mind, but we'll get the Prime Minister's views on it, I hope, a little bit later, pushed the dial very clearly towards uh, a hardish Brexit for Britain, but perhaps that's to be discussed uh, in a moment. Now, I don't want to be too gloomy, so I thought I'd give you seven reasons to be cheerful for 2017. Uh, this is being optimistic, but Islamic State, um, I think, will be pressured on the ground. Uh, it is being squeezed, attacked in, in, in Mosul, perhaps this year, also losing 
uh, its headquarters in Syria as well as Iraq, uh, Raqqa, and so much of the appeal of Islamic State has been its uh, state-like quality of holding on to territory, commanding territory. So if it is pushed out of all these uh, strongholds, it doesn't mean it disappears, uh, it mutates, it, it, uh, Islamism goes to, um, to uh, it takes other forms, but it is a very significant uh, development. It's a bumper year for culture in Europe in particular. Of course, next year will be, as we know, a bumper year for Valletta as cultural capital of Europe. But even this year, we have a once in a decade uh, cultural fest of, of documenta, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the one that, um, I can't remember the second one, but also the Biennale in Venice. Uh, all three coming together, giant, um, giant cultural extravaganza for lovers of model art. So if you get fed up with the world uh, of politics, you can always pack your bags and go around the cultural, do the grand cultural tour of 2017. I put down here millennial zest. I hope that you will get, have a chance to read the uh, section of millennial, young millennials who give their forecasts for 2017 because it gives a sense of optimism and welcoming change in the world which is very refreshing and I think that generation is worth listening to. It's the uh, biggest generation and it's going to be a very influential one and it's on the whole very positive one. Perhaps wishful thinking again, a Cyprus deal, possibly fingers crossed in 2017, that would be a landmark following the Columbia uh, deal that we had that we've just had uh, the rise of women executives we have a very uh, excellent um, uh, we have a very uh, excellent uh, 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 contribution from um, Lucy Kellaway who predicts that women will be making great strides in the boardroom in this year and in the US now you may be depressed about um, Donald, Donald Trump, so you may be happy about Donald Trump, but the, I think the economy will be pretty good in 2017. And Loving versus Virginia is the 50th anniversary of a landmark uh, deal in, uh, in uh, uh, the interracial marriage and in interracial relations in America, and there's a big Hollywood movie uh, just coming out about that. So reasons to be cheerful. Also, finally, not least, Canada throws a big birthday party. It's 150 in 2017. There you go, birthday cake for Canada. Uh, six things that will come to an end very briefly. Roaming charges in Europe, yay. Couple of uh, space missions that are ending. F few iconic things, Galois packaging, Fr plain packaging comes in in France. Australia stops making its iconic Holden cars. BlackBerry stops uh, producing telephones. Remember when Barack Obama was inaugurated, BlackBerrys were the big things. And uh, Barack Obama leaves today. We have a lovely obituary of uh, the Obama administration, which focuses on the presidential pause. So we're going to have a different style. You can say goodbye to the thoughtful Barack Obama presidential pause, the subject of many an academic study. There you go. Now, five new categories of jobs. You think, I think this is particularly fascinating. We get on to technology here. People are very concerned and worried about the way that the world of work is changing. But it's worth remembering that new types of jobs are appearing as old types disappearing. So here is some ideas on the types of jobs that will be growing to look out for in the future that hardly exist today or didn't exist at all a few years ago. So the bot economy is, is arriving. My colleague Tom Standish talks about bot wranglers, the people who work in the bot uh, economy. That's going to be uh, a, a growing area, as indeed is the whole drone economy. You know about military drones, but drones are used for all sorts of things increasingly, disaster relief, environmental monitoring, recreational use. So lots and lots of people are needed not only to make and service, but to fly these, these drones. In the world of virtual reality, we'll need fashion designers, virtual fashion designers, as well as real world fashion designers. Maybe there's some of you in this room to make us look, our virtual selves look beautiful. Farming no longer has to take place in the outdoor world. It can take place increasingly, will take place increasingly indoors, hydroponic farming, uh, controlled, clever environments. Uh, so we'll need more of those people. And then synthetic tissue engineers. This is a medical 
technology which is really coming to the fore now, something that is starting to happen. You're going to need the people to make these replacement body parts, re make replacement tissues. Actually, just uh, this week I was talking to someone who's had an operation involving one of these things. It's really happening, and it's a growing, growing area. And just to show you this other chart, because I think it's fascinating, this is actually existing jobs. These are Bureau of Labor Statistics in America that show you which types of jobs are expected to grow, according to their survey, to grow most over the next 10 years of existing jobs. And you can see the top category, fastest growing job there, wind turbine service technicians. It may not be what you wanted to be when you grow up. Um, Mom, I want to be a wind, wind, service, wind turbine service technician. But it makes sense. There's lots of uh, wind power. They need to be serviced. A lot of other of those occupations uh, are to do with demographic trends, uh, the aging of the population. So you see lots of uh, caring professions, uh, occupational therapies, home health aides, nurse practitioners, and so on. So, and then some other ones, commercial uh, divers, um, ambulance drivers, not necessarily the most highly skilled jobs. It's a real mixture. So I think if you look at these two together, you get an intriguing picture of the world of work uh, of the future. Uh, on the technology front, still staying with the technology front, it struck me, editing the publication, that um, in many ways the big trend in technology is it's getting more personalized. And that's true of medicine, personal medicine, targeted medicine, because of the speed with which uh, DNA sequencing is happening, means that you can uh, no longer look at broad categories of disease, but increasingly for cancer, for example, you say, well, this drug is the one that's likely to work with your particular uh, cancer. That's, um, that trend is, is a, a very, very important and fast developing one. Um, here's an example of a machine through machine learning uh, becoming very smart at recognizing your mood from your facial expressions and from your voice. So your robot becomes your shrink, in effect. Uh, virtual reality, I mentioned, coming in more and more, extremely personal technology, developing very rapidly. And then per digital personal assistants. How many of you in this room have an Amazon Echo? How many of you? One or two? It's very small numbers still, but it's coming. And it's, uh, it, the people who have them say the sorts of things that they say, said about not just Amazon Echo, but other equivalent technologies, the same sorts of things they said about smartphones when they arrived. They're not just gimmicks, they're genuinely useful. So these are machines, thanks to the development of, uh, uh, of language, speech recognition technology, and artificial intelligence, are very easy to interact with because you can speak to them, and they're developing very, very fast. More somber level, three reasons to be worried about the lowering of the threshold of, of nuclear power. One is Vladimir Putin, who talks increasingly about the use of tactical nuclear weapons. Not that he's going to, I'm not standing here predicting we're going to have nuclear uh, cataclysm in 2017. But I think that's a worry. Kim Jong-un, of course, uh, testing away and very unpredictable. And then uh, ISIS uh, in the middle there, I think precisely because it may be losing territory on the ground. We have to worry about what it might do to lash out outside, and some sort of dirty bomb is something that we know that, uh, that, that they're interested in. So just, I think, a, a somber thought that's worth bearing in mind. Uh, very briefly, two emerging market giants, always worth thinking about what China and India are up to. This is our table of fastest growing and slowest growing economies in the year ahead. And what I want to point out there is, first of all, no economy is growing terribly fast. No economy is managing over 10%. So it's, we're in a generally not very, in some past years, you would have got plenty of economies that were. Uh, Venezuela disaster at the bottom there, uh, watching because of the consequences of that economic disaster. But the real one is India, it's the only large economy in the top 10. In previous years, China would have routinely been in the top 10, now only India. Uh, so India, despite a blip of its demonetization program where it withdrew all these high denomination notes, I think still has a lot of momentum to it. China, this is an intriguing chart, it, two charts actually, which tell a story about China. These are actually gaming revenues in Macau. 
and you can see the red line at the top are the high rollers, the VIP gamers, and you can see they dropped very sharply in 2014 and 2015, and that was because of the crackdown on corruption. But the blue line is the mainstream, the mass market gaming, and that, for this year, for the first time, is to, to predicted to be even higher than the VIP gamers. So there you can see the trend of the mass market, the mass consumer in China mattering more and more. And here's another uh, illustration of that. Um, apologies, I took this from a screenshot. It's not very beautiful. But you can see it's China's box office take for the first time this year expected to overtake America's, which is extraordinary. Building cinemas at an extraordinary pace. So the mass entertainment industry in China is getting bigger than than America's. Okay, we're down to one, the big drum roll, the final one thing to watch, perhaps above all else in the year ahead, and perhaps it's no great surprise, it's this man now, as of uh, this evening, President of the United States. And before we go on to talk about this with the Prime Minister, I would just perhaps make three observations about uh, Donald Trump, about what his presidency is likely to be. Uh, I think it will be, first of all, summed up in three words, perhaps. Unconventional. His candidacy was unconventional. He's been an unconventional president-elect, and I see absolutely no reason to expect him to change his uh, essence as president. So you can expect him to be an unconventional president. Unpredictable, because he is prone to react often with the gut and we've seen on numerous occasions that uh, he says one thing, he says another thing. It's very hard to know what's going to happen from day to day. So I think we can expect quite a roller coaster ride uh, in, that, uh, in that respect. And because of those two things, unpredictable and unconventional, I think it will be an uncomfortable presidency for many. It'll be a disruptive presidency, which is not necessarily a de derogatory thing to say. It's a deliberately disruptive presidency. He wants to disrupt. It's a regime change presidency, but brace yourselves, strap yourselves in, it won't be a, an easy ride. So with that, that's, a, I hope, a, a, a prelude picture of 2017. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>